Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. So, yeah, thanks for being here, guys. Um, welcome, and uh, thanks to everyone who's in the, the audience joining us. Uh, my name is Adrienne Fast. I'm the former curator of art and visual culture at the Reach Gallery Museum. I'm really happy to be here virtually with uh, the artists Karen Bubash, Natalie Hunter, and Karen Zalomea to talk about each of your practices and about the work that you have in the current exhibition, Image Object, current, uh, New Approaches to Three-Dimensional Photography, which just happened to be the last exhibition that I curated at The Reach. Um, so it's really nice to be with you guys virtually. Um, I'm gonna offer just really brief introductions to each of your practices and then we can get into the conversation. So I'm gonna go alphabetically. So Karen Bubash is a widely exhibited contemporary artist originally from North Vancouver. She studied at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, uh, and she first attracted attention for her early photographic series uh, titled uh, Florence and George and Ivy House are two that I, I think of particularly that captured humble and kind of ordinary objects in overlooked spaces. Um, I sometimes I heard them described as sort of portraits without people, which I thought was a really nice way of describing it, where you see sort of like the interiors of spaces and get to know an absent person through their environment. Um, more recently, though, her focus has shifted to landscape studies that highlight attention, often between nature and culture, and between the humble and the sublime. Uh, the ex exhibition image object includes several works from her series, Paper Forest, which are large landscape photos that are painstakingly constructed into three-dimensional tableau of dense Pacific Northwest forest scenes made using a technique called paper tool. Next, we have uh, Natalie Hunter. Natalie is an interdisciplinary artist from Hamilton, Ontario, and she studied fine art both at the University of Waterloo and at Brock University in St. Catharines. Natalie works at the intersection, I think of it as Venn diagrams that overlap in the center between photography, sculpture, and installation. And where all of those overlap, that's where Natalie is. Um, so she creates these multi-layered and immersive photo inst photo based installations on materials like transparent film or translucent silk. And then in works like Edge of the Sky, which is on display at the Reach, she then drapes and wraps these materials over armatures to create three dimensional kind of sculptural constructions that change as light passes through it and as visitors walk around it. Her work also often references the passage of time. So like in the series Scent of the Sun, also on display, which uses photography to express changing experiences of light throughout the year. Um, specifically in that work, she's referencing the spring and fall equinoxes and the summer and winter solstices. And then last but not least, we have Karen Zalamea. Karen is a Filipino Canadian artist and cultural worker based in Burnaby, BC, who also studied at Emily Carr University, but also at Concordia University in Montreal. Her artistic practice is also rooted in photography, and she is particularly interested in exploring the material qualities of the photographic surface itself and the way that the photograph can mediate or manage the relationship between the body and space. Um, Karen is represented in the exhibition through a number of distinct but related series. So there's two series called Scene and Weathering that both consist of detailed landscape studies that are printed on a variety of different kinds of materials that really draw attention to the surface of the image. And then there are also several works from the new series, Sunken Garden, that are related to the artist's ancestral home and house in Quezon City, the Philippines. And we'll talk a little bit more about sort of all of those works um, in a minute. But before we get into sort of what each of you are working on now, I have a general question for all of you because you all went to art school where I assume you took classes in or were exposed to all different kinds of media, painting, sculpture, you know, uh, video, whatever. And yet all of your practices are either exclusively or predominantly photo-based. So my question is, when did you know that photography was really your medium? And I suppose a related question or another way to ask it is sort of like, what can you express in a photographic voice that you're not able to express through other media? Um, so anyone who would like to go first and answer that question? I can go, I guess, sure. <laughs> surprisingly. Right. You know, it's funny, I, I've been thinking back about this and um, I was really into realism in high school. And, you know, it was the, early 90s and my source material was terrible pictures from fashion magazines or like YM and Sassy and I'd spend like hours doing these pretty tacky paintings <laughs> but I had a really great um 
photo teacher who who suggested that maybe photography might be the route based on the kind of painting I was doing and from that point on it just took off like I'd spent hours in my high school dark room and it was sort of a natural evolution from there and I think like painting is a very solitary act and with photography I always liked that I was able to collaborate with friends as well and like be out in the environment so you knew before you started at Emily Carr that you were interested in pursuing a photo sort of practice or that sort of education as well. Probably like oh, what a great advantage to have had like a exposure to photography in a photo studio in high school. I mean, there, there definitely was a period of time where I wasn't sure and I was doing both. But, you know, when I look back on that time period, I was, you know, I was obsessed. I would go in on weekends and print by myself in my high school darkroom, which is really amazing that my instructor at the time allowed that <laughs> with oh. probably some like toxic materials and like oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah yeah <laughs> um and natalie and other karen um would one of you like to jump in did you, you get started early did you discover it in art school what about what about you natalie would you like to, to go yeah um for me i actually began my practice as a sculptor <laughs> and uh, uh went into grad school as a sculptor and kind of came out this weird sort of photo-based installation artist um but I started uh using or taking film and and uh, digital imaging courses in grad school but I also have a background in visual culture so I, at, from Brock so I feel like that kind of translated somehow um but yeah, with photography, I really love that I'm able to explore really immaterial or ephemeral concepts like time and light and memory. And I think photography is a great medium for exploring these really ephemeral concepts more so than other medium. And it's a, a medium that really speaks to very temporal aspects of our culture um like light memory the senses and time and light are really integral to the making of photography um so you know for me I kind of want to play with that and play with time and light both in the making of my images and the installation of them um but which also kind of introduces an element of chance um which is really interesting maybe less so now because everyone's just so obsessed with with digital immediate responses on our phones, but there is a, a kind of poetic um, response to chance with actual film photography, um, which I find really nice. But Karen, did you want to jump in? Karen Zellamea? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, yeah, similar to Karen. Uh, for me, it was in high school, learning how to use for the first time a 35 millimeter film camera, developing black and white film, spending hours and hours in the dark room amongst toxic chemicals and not wearing gloves and just getting in there. Um, and it's the real experience of like magically seeing this, an image develop in front of you. And I think I, I just fell in love with the medium that way. And also how it uh, consciously makes you think about ways of seeing, ways of, ways of observing um, and, and working with, you know, as Natalie said, with time, light, composition, elements of chance, and these are still, you know, fundamental elements that inform photography to this day and things that you still have to, to, to juggle with. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, I'm not sure if we're the same age, Karen, but, you know, I went to Emily Carr in the mid 90s. And at that time, there's such a, you know, the constant conversation was that painting was dead. It was the <laughs> painting painting had no future and photography like there was just so many exciting things happening with photography and it just felt like I mean being a woman it just felt like there was room for me to make work and like the doors were sort of opening and digital was new everything was brand new and there was uh, a lot of progress happening and then there was also magazines I mean there's so many magazines that were being produced at that time we didn't have you know Instagram. <laughs> so just the possibilities were um, exciting. Probably for both of you also being in Vancouver, which um, has such a legacy of conceptual and contemporary photographic work, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if Hamilton uh, or in Ontario, if you were exposed to those kinds of those things that were happening, Natalie, but I can see going to like art school in Vancouver. Yeah. At that time, they, they mm-hmm. weren't, they weren't pushing uh, a lot of students to go into painting anymore like they photography were. was and that's where all the exciting stuff that's where the cool kids hung out <laughs> <laughs> so no regrets amongst any of you that you didn't become a painter <laughs> well but I mean it's kind of have come back to it in little bits and pieces but you know <laughs> so uh, you all obviously like you you all started your photographic journeys working with analog film um mm-hmm. uh and have been involved through the the sort of the revolution with uh, digital, but all of you also, although you do do what I would call like straight photography in a way where it's like sort of straightforwardly two-dimensional, straightforwardly representational more or less, um, as the exhibition makes clear, you also all kind of like to experiment with pushing the limits of what we expect photography to be and like what it could be. Um, could each of you maybe just speak a little bit? I think you're t- you've touched on this a little bit already, but like what excites you or interests you about pushing photography in some of these more experimental ways? Let's go backwards. I'm going to go back to Karen Delamea now. And so we'll circle back. Karen, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential and possibilities in thinking about photography in an expanded way. And certainly the, the medium is ubiquitous and accessible and you can take a quick snap on your smartphone and I love that it's it's accessible that way but with that ubiquity comes also um the conventions hard laden with conventions and expectations um so we come to for example a landscape photo with certain expectations or even a vacation photo or or a portrait with certain expectations and you can those conventions for sure. It's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's um, really rich territory in exploring where you can go if you challenge those conventions. And so thinking about other ways of photographing or perhaps even treating the camera as a site of experimentation or printing on different materials as you see in the exhibition or manipulating those printed materials further. So for me, that's um, where experimenting within photography is is really uh rich with much potential and invention natalie or other karen any thoughts um well i have a a fascination for both image making and also working with materials by hand so i remember when i first started making images i was really frustrated by the screen um and I just wanted to kind of like get in there and just like do what I wanted to do with my hands and for me like a a way of getting around that was um I would make these like transparency Xerox copies at the library um in grad school because it was cheaper than you know going and getting like snapshots made at like a photo lab and I would work with them Um, in my studio in a physical way to help kind of make decisions based on how I wanted to, you know, process my images. And I ended up kind of realizing that I loved the way that they bent and curled and folded in my hands and the way that they kind of, you know, compounded space um, through layering or folding um, and they made latent images. So that kind of surprise of making a two-dimensional medium into something very spatial and experiential was a a kind of aha moment for me Um, and I kind of recognized that potential of kind of challenging the the 2D screen world that uh, we currently live in and kind of pushing the boundaries of and properties of photography in terms of light and time and space and making them a physical experience um so ever since i've kind of tried to push that and push kind of photography's potential um so i guess i'm kind of interested in disrupting i guess the screen in a way (laughs) we're trying to which is really hard but it's interesting that that, uh, it 
to me, it relates back to what you say, like you started out as a, in sculpture and you started out like the physical sort of handling of material. And so it's interesting, like that is, it seems to me what you're doing with photography is sort of sculpturally manipulating and moving it around with your hands in space. So there seems a, to be quite a sight line that kind of connects those two that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I thought I, I thought I would tell that story about <laughs> that aha moment, but. <laughs> Interesting because um, I hadn't really thought about this until you were saying it, but at the house that I grew up in, my dad had an office as part of our house and had, he had his own photocopier machine. So I actually spent tons of time photocopying and working with printed images and doing layouts in my room. And I hadn't even really considered how much of an impact that had on me, but it's, yeah, it's pretty amazing to be able to make instant copies. And I mean, even if, if I didn't see those photocopies as final works, it was helping with layout or editing or planning ideas. What an amazing way or tool to have at your disposal at home growing up. Yeah, it really, really was. <laughs> My dad, I stole a lot of rulers and uh, <laughs> things from his office and <laughs> getting, getting yelled at a lot, but um. <laughs> Uh, for, I mean, yeah, I think to answer this question, I was thinking about it earlier and I've never really considered myself like an experimental photographer or a rule breaker, but, um, it's just every, every time I've tried a new project, it's been more asking a question of myself or sort of posing a question and seeing what the answer would be. And with the, with this particular work, uh, Adrian's heard the whole story. I, was at the PE, which is like our, for people who don't know, if there's someone far away, it's like a big amusement park that hap happens once a year. Uh, so there's rides and venues. And anyway, someone was selling uh, cutout toll prints of The Last Supper. So like little Leonardo da Vinci and it with this layered um, process. And I was just looking at it and thinking that it was really interesting. And I'd always struggled with sculpture, but somehow, the idea of building out a two-dimensional picture and making it like a pop-out seemed like an interesting kind of approach to try. And I'd been working with photographing interiors and my friend's messy apartments. And so there was uh, like laundry baskets and because everyone was students, beer cans and posters. And I had been taking these pictures and it seemed like, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try this craft technique and see what happens. And you know, it, it was very difficult at the time. I was printing 16 by 16 inch pictures, which for the late nineties were considered large prints and making many layers of them and having the hand cut around each object. And I used foam core and then the, the sides of the paper was white from the cutting. So I had to take a marker and retrace out around everything so that the white didn't kind of disrupt from the image. And to do six pieces that were included in this uh, show at an artist run center here was so labor intensive. And I just thought I'll never make this work again. Like it was just, even though I was happy with the pieces, it was just, you know, there was, I didn't really glue some of them properly. I was using a hot glue gun. I kept burning my hands. I just thought like, why am I going through this? <laughs> and so I um, shelved that idea, even though I think at the time people thought there it was kind of interesting. Um, and so then flash forward to, this body of work. I have a friend who had bought a laser cutter and she was working on some jewelry and she was showing me how her laser cutter work and then worked. And then I suddenly had the epiphany that if it, I could cut down on the actual cutting that um, it would make the assembly so much easier and I could possibly work on a larger scale. And so they've slowly been growing in size. They started with 24 by 24 and then I keep getting nudged to make them larger. And so this is what we have in the show. And it's very just large. stupid work, stupid work. I spend, spend hours and I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I'm Amazing. like to punish. So years ago, one of my male contemporaries referred to me as the Martha Stewart of photography. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> You talk, you call, call paper tool also like a craft technique, which I guess it is, but it also to me, like, um, and I think you've, you've mentioned to me privately sometimes, like, 
don't call them paper tools call them like photographic sculpture or, or yeah like that. well that's the thing it's like this whole discussion like if a woman does work it's craft mm -hmm. whereas if a man were maybe to approach this it would be important sculpture like I don't know but it's, it also harkens back to sort of like the debates around photography itself mm -hmm. as a medium and like is this like a, a fine art a fine art technique or is it a, a, a mechanical um, craft or uh, a science etc so all of these things and that a, a part of like part of what drew me to that body of work was just the opportunity to talk about some of those tensions and none of them is none of it is resolved it just and when you're standing in front of the work it's so amazing that it kind of doesn't matter but but it's um, like what Natalie was saying it brings you back to the surface that it's ultimately just a paper object that can be cut and it can be bent and it can be folded and it's just this optical illusion that happens when in a certain way and I just I love the simplicity of that and I loved in your statement about the work you know it's all work that you have to experience Instagram none of these pictures in the slideshow it just doesn't do it justice for actually being in the exhibition space and it does I do feel like quite a fraud because all of the everything I wrote about the exhibition was like you have to see it in person the images of it don't like do it justice it doesn't like it has to be experienced in the room and I mm -hmm. actually haven't seen the exhibition because <laughs> but you should sort of have touched on a little bit like the experience of how we encounter how we usually encounter images now which is through a screen um mm. so either through our laptops through our television screen or more likely through our smartphones and there's something about the way that images all of our experience with images get sort of reduced to a very sameness um, everything is the same size. Everything is the relationship to the body is the same. Um, and there's a real flattening out of images and our experience with them. I think that we we all are used to now um, and has become sort of ubiquitous. But what I like about all of your work is the ability, it, all of it expresses the ability of photographs to surprise you when you encounter them in the flesh, when you're actually taking up space with them. So like in all of your work, I've experienced the kind of like, oh, it's like, it's different than I expected. Like there's like that sort of like moment of surprise when you see it in person. Um, and one of the ways that that can happen is through messing with our expectations around the sense of scale. So mm -hmm. things that we think might be very small and intimate being blown up very large or things that are monumental being rendered very intimate. Um, this is a question specifically addressed to Karen Zalamea because I think about the way that you played with scale, especially in um, the, the um, scene, the collaged images of scene, but also I think with um, your Sunken Garden series. Could you talk just a little bit about, is scale something that you really think about when you're working and, and how do you like to play with scale? Yeah, scale isn't uh, necessarily something I'm thinking about at the time when I'm photographing, it's more so, um, I'm sorry, there's someone using a leaf blower outside my window, so hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> um, okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, but it's something I think about once I've amassed images, once I have developed negatives or my digital files and thinking through post-production and printing and presentation. And so for example, in Sunken Garden Staircase, which is the large banner image of marble and it's eight feet high by 12 feet wide. I think it's the largest photograph I've created to date. And I had intentionally wanted it to be large scale, to be an immersive experience of the marble. Uh, and for me, the project originated, as you mentioned, Adrian, in my ancestral house in Quezon City. And so what I wanted to do was photograph details from the home. So I photographed each of the 14 marble steps in the house and digitally merged all 14 of the images together, matching up the veining and the textures of the marble to create the monumental photograph. And for me, that action is uh, an imagined restoration of the extracted stone back to the quarry or back to the land. And so wanting to uh, communicate that sense of vastness of the return to the land within this immersive photograph. But in contrast, um, also in the show is scene where which are much smaller, you know, collage elements. I think roughly each cluster is about 20 by 24 inches and printed on different substrates like canvas and metallic paper. And for that series, 
as well as for weathering, I was photographing throughout the American West, and I wasn't so interested in in representing specific geographic locations or landmarks, but more so observing like surface topographies, thinking about um, the surface of the landscape as it would be translated onto the photographic surface. And I think working in a smaller scale that can be really physically, materially handled by hand and manipulated uh, and also shot from different different vantage points. So you're not entirely sure if you're looking at a detail of a rock or the side of a mountain and layering all of these um, di different vantage points and orientations onto one another and having them printed at a smaller scale, which then invites a closer, more intimate viewing, I think heightens that sense of disorientation and ungrounding. So I think those are two different ways in which scale functions in the exhibition. And you mentioned like the, the way that those images then invite that more intimate viewing. So you come very close up to, you're forced to come very close up to the, to the surface of the image to, to view them. And that's really where you get the, the sense of the different materials that you've chosen to print on. So that some of the images are on metallic paper, some are on like rag paper that seem very sort of fibrous. Um, you mentioned that printing on, uh, that in another work, you're printing on a banner, which communicates a different kind of sense. So my, my sort of follow-up question is, I get a sense that each one of these images that you've, that you've taken would feel or mean slightly something different depending on the material that you chose to print it on. So it's sort of like, a, it's just like a curiosity about your process. Do you experiment with printing the same image on different types of supports? to get what you think is sort of like the right combination? Or do you know like this is going to be, a, a, this image is going to work better on fibrous paper or metallic paper? Yeah, I don't necessarily print the same image on different materials. I think there's a lot of research that goes into it in viewing um, other artists works and exhibitions and seeing what may or may not work or viewing samples or even just printing small test strips. but. For me, for for example, for weathering, which is printed on silk, I knew I really wanted the images to to be, you know, slippery and fold and drape uh, and function as like topographical skins. And I had seen other artists print on silk, and I really uh, really liked the way that it retained the image detail and color reproduction too. So, so it functioned from a technical point of view, but also conceptually fed into how I was working with the imagery. So really wonderful bridge there because you mentioned working on silk, which is something that Natalie also you have experimented with and you've done some series where you're printing on silk. Was your choice to print on silk, uh, does it sort of echo what Karen has talked about that like the idea that it's kind of this, it's almost like a delicate kind of skin. Was that the reason why you chose to work with silk? Or can you talk a little bit about that experience for you? Oh, you're, you're still muted, Natalie. Sorry. Sorry, I was just trying to be polite. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it kind of, uh, kind of similar, but also kind of different. Um, um, so I'm kind of really interested in, you know, I regularly fold and drape and layer my transparent film images in space and that material kind of allows me to do that in a particular way based on the material properties, almost, you know, curving it through space. Um, but I wondered how this would carry forward with other materials and what prompted me to begin using silk was this um, encounter with a viewer a number of years ago in one of my exhibitions where a viewer had reached out and touched and tried to like pull on one of my transparent film pieces um, and he came to me after and exclaimed that he thought what he was reaching out to was a piece of textile mm -hmm. or was a textile installation but was really surprised when he touched it and he realized what it was and this sort of really interested me like based on how my work was lit how the light was kind of throwing itself through the the material into the corner combined with the material and how it was installed I was able to sort of fool a viewer into thinking that they were seeing something altogether materially different than what it was so then I was like 
maybe I should start using textiles or maybe I need to explore this a little more uh, in terms of understanding how my work translates in space. And so I wanted a material that um, kind of maintains that translucency or that transparency that um, was related to my transparent film pieces. Um, but the silk is interesting because, you know, it's thin, it's slippery, it wrinkles very easily. I'm sure Karen knows that. <laughs> um, but I liked how it ran through my hands and it sort of like felt like water. Mm -hmm. And I liked how the light passed through it and sort of made a mirror image on the other side. So you can kind of experience the image from both sides. Um, but they kind of reminded me of like skin or a membrane or connected to the body, but also something domestic that's that's sort of like laundry hanging in the sun or like bedding or something. Um, so yeah, so most of the work that is shown, well, all of it in image object is on transparent film, but I've used um, other materials as well for their material and image-based properties, but yeah. I would think that you guys, by, by printing all these very different types of materials, you do in a way, invite that well it encourages people want to touch it people yeah. are going to want to like when you see these different like I would like to touch all of the work <laughs> so I'm yeah. sure, sure you probably come across that in uh, when you've shown your work before I'll probably all of you where people sort of want to reach out and sort of yeah you would actually and it, and it didn't make me mad or anything it, it was I was just really interested in you know oh wow like I didn't even see that in mm -hmm. my own work right and you Response. thought it was something that materially it wasn't. Um, so that was a kind of um, nice surprise. Uh, but yeah. So you touched on uh, the fact that your work is, is unique uh, in this exhibition, that it's the, the only work where light passes all the way through the photographic image. So we're used to the idea that like light has to pass through a lens to create a photographic image, but then you take that photographic image, make it transparent, put it on transparent materials, so the light shines through it. I think of it as, and then the, sh the colored shadow that it creates on the wall or on the floor or the surrounding space, which then moves as the exhibition changes in times of day and through the seasons, it really sort of expands the boundary of the, of the art object per se, that it's not just the photographic image, but also this, this expanded image, this expanded shadow. Um, and I was thinking about this quality of your work and also the fact that the, the images, the colors that you use, the, the images, the shadow, the, it can be a very, it's often very beautiful, like very overwhelmingly, sort of like awe-inspiringly beautiful. And I had this moment where I thought it almost functions like a kind of secular stained glass window where it's, it's light is passing through it and it's creating this sense of awe at this beautiful pattern. Is that something that people have, 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 that you've thought of before, that people have mentioned? Is that a sort of a comparison that resonates with you at all? Yeah, I mean, I can understand that comparison. Um, I wouldn't say that it's sort of spiritual in a way, but more, I think it connects more with the sublime perhaps, um, or this idea of transcendent. And I think transcendence, and I think a lot of artists throughout art history um, have been, you know, using light and responding to light in very representational ways throughout history, like Impressionist paintings, for example, or even in very material ways, like the sculpture that was coming out of the light and space movement um, in the 70s. But I think it was quite natural for me, both as someone who enjoys working with materials and images, to draw attention to um, light and time, like the integral foundational um, components of photography. But also, you know, photographs are very static objects. And for me, I wanted to create a kind of durational um, encounter um, for the viewer. Um, and my physical use of light, uh, hopefully sort of challenges this idea of a photograph as this static frozen moment in time but as a kind of durational material um fluid thing and you know for me it's akin to kind of like 
memory or thought or light and time. These are very fluid concepts, um, but we often kind of perceive the photograph as something that is very static and related to truth. Um, as opposed to related but, to subjective experience and right. like, yeah. it was yeah. something that occurred to me, um, maybe uh, also now having uh, actually left Abbotsford and come somewhere else, but it, I was preparing for this talk and this, this idea, this came to me like that it sort of feels like potentially like a similar experience to st stained glass windows. And it's always different when you exhibit work in different contexts and different communities um, because Abbotsford has been referred to uh, by some people as the buckle of the Bible belt. Um, I did wonder, oh. like, wonder if any of the visitors to the exhibition at the reach have, have, if it resonates with audiences there in that way, it was just, it was something that crossed my mind. Yeah. Well, I'll have to check in um, with, uh, with Kate afterwards and ask if anyone, anyone has talked to the gallery attendants along those lines. But I did have one more question for you, which was that um, you've talked about the like the 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 work is maybe related to ideas of the sublime and, and that connects us to sort of concepts and discussions around nature particularly because a lot of your subject matter is drawing from nature the natural world from the landscape um, the rhythm of the seasons the the rhythm of times of day and things like that but there are sometimes we, you and I have talked there are some works where you have worked with the human figure as well and I was just wanting to if you could maybe express a little bit about what that experience is like for you like how do you is it very different when you're working with human subject matter are there certain series where you feel like that the human subject needs to be brought in in particular um, and just what the, those choices are for you in your practice yeah um for me, it kind of speaks more to, you know, ideas of embodiment and what would be more appropriate in terms of expressing ideas through the senses and um, photography prioritizes the visual sense. And I find it kind of interesting to challenge that idea in terms of um, tactility. Mm -hmm. And so I guess a lot, the majority of my work is, is seen to be a bit more abstract or not really abstract, but from the perspective of the body or the camera's point of view. Um, and for me, I, I do that to kind of help the viewer insert themselves into the work a, a bit better. Um, but I'm also interested in how light and time affect um, our bodies. So I do sometimes work with the human figure. And one of those um, Examples was a body of work that I made with my mother's hands in 2017, and they are photographs, but also photo-based sculptures that looked at that relationship between light and touch. And so I invited my mother to, to kind of interact with um, the drapes um, and her window, excuse me, um, as the light sort of filtered through um, and how she kind of handled um, the drapery material um and that is sort of something I'm still sort of interested in but in 2021 I also had a solo exhibition at Smokesta Smokestack Gallery in Hamilton and that was actually the first time that I showed just a small portion of Scent of the Sun mm -hmm. um but the show was called When I See I Breathe Light and the photographs most of them were made um, within the space of the of a breath as my exposure time. So I was interested in this idea of kind of challenging the length of it of an exposure to make it closer to a kind of body understanding of time rather than a very quick mechanical understanding of time, which kind of resulted in these very ethereal multiple multiple exposure images that you know, are from the perspective of the body, but aren't necessarily representational of the body. Mm. Um, and it's I think- way To bring in as you like this, that relationship yeah. with the, the photograph, the image to bodily experience without it necessarily being the what is represented, but still yeah. the process and the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the human form is present in, you know, in works and image objects, probably through its absence. Like if you look at Scent of the Sun, um, most of the images are, are like these floating windows that look outward from the camera, or outward from the body. So there is, there is that kind of reference to the body through a framed view, um, but 
you know, the body and, isn't represented. Um, and also like it, it does reference sort of like built environment, like homes, like you have like sort of yeah. like lines of a window. Like, again, it's sort of like the, the, the human figure is obliquely referred to. Uh, as yeah. Sort of like, Maybe not. Kind of like architecture and the spaces that we dwell in kind of shape our human experience as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. That leads really nicely to my next question, which is for Karen Bubash, because you more your more recent sort of um, landscape photographic work usually includes a, a sole human figure, usually a woman with her back turned uh, to the camera. But in this series, Paper Forest, the, the human figure is entirely absent. Was there sort of like practical reasons for that? Or was there was that a conscious choice to, to depict the uninhabited forest for this series? Yeah, I mean, all my projects always start off with a question. And so for me, the question was, I started thinking about Emily Carr and the places where she, I imagined that she had made her paintings. And so it was like, if I entered those spaces, what would what would my pictures look like? Uh, so it's it pretty broad, but um, in the back of my mind, I was thinking about revisiting this whole toll technique. You know, I'd seen my friend's laser cutter. And so it was really just an, an experiment to see how the process would translate to the images that I took. And so initially I'd wanted to travel to Haida Gwaii and but I was pregnant and you have to go on a Zodiac boat. And so I was not allowed <laughs> to do that trip. So I had to re-plan. And so I traveled around Vancouver Island and went to areas near Tofino and really just focused on being in the forest and looking at the forest. And, you know, I have lots and lots of pictures and then eventually narrowed it down to a few that I thought would um, translate to be these sculptures. So it's kind of a slow process, but yeah, I think if I, I have thought that maybe one day in the future, if I introduced a figure or a few figures, I see it taking on more of like the traditional kind of like the freeze sculptures where there's a story that happens as you go along the picture, but I haven't quite figured out what the story would be. Okay. So, you know, there's definitely little seeds planted and we'll see what happens. That could be interesting because like, again with free sculptures you're you're usually following like a narrative and like through yeah. time so you have the same figure that might recur over time so you can think of the the narrative unfolding um uh as time goes by um, i have this be... ongoing trouble with with stories like i i've often thought that maybe i would do a short film and then i i psych myself out over the actual story like with the still picture it's the implied story but like how much of a story do i want to give away and i always like the interaction with the viewer you know especially with the women in landscapes people bring so much to these pictures and there's um of what they think is happening or why they're being positioned or you know and i i love that kind of collaboration there's so then to to actually have a story then it seems like <laughs> it's taking away from all my previous work so one day i'll solve the problem Your, it's story in a moment <laughs> yeah. Story, yeah. the story gets um, and you've you've told the story of the paper toll. I do want to say that the, that in a weird way, paper toll is what brought this exhibition together, because uh, uh, I was drawn um, particularly to your paper toll work uh, because my mother did paper toll uh, through most of my childhood, um, and that was sort of the seed that got me thinking about three dimensional photography. And that, that and your mom's uh, paper tolls are so good. Adrian showed me some of them. I mean, the detail she puts my work to shame. She had little bits of um, like. Was it a glue to make it look like a glistening on yeah. the windowsills? And I mean, it's it's fantastic. You have a couple of pieces of hers here in Saskatoon, and they are quite remarkable. She never worked in photography, so it was always sort of like you know, um, like prints, like like mechanical yeah. reproduction prints of things. So, yeah, most people seem to do, but yeah. So we all we owe this all this whole thing to paper toll. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my mom because she was so excited when I said I was working with a paper toll artist. She was like that, and because again, she would always say. She says she's not an artist, you know, that's because in her mind, she didn't make the image that she only like layered it up. I was like, well, in, in your case, you made the image as well. So then she decided that you were a real artist. <laughs> but I, I you're also because your paper toll work, I just want to ask really quickly. 
uh, was the inspiration for the Reach's very popular culture kits or edu kits this season, oh, yeah. where we have the little paper toll kits that can be taken away by kids or by educators and used in schools. So to teach all kinds of ideas and to connect people to the exhibition. I know you took a supply of these to your son's school. I just want to know how did that go over? It went over really well. Um, I know that the younger kids have not done them yet. The older kids did them. And even in my, my son's in grade five, he's in a five, six split. And um, there was a little, little bit more difficulty than the teacher anticipated with um, with assembling them. So uh, I think just with the little kids and the use of the scissors. So they were, there's going to be planning a big buddy, little yeah. buddy system where they're going to go into the classrooms and help them. But yeah, it was exciting. Well, and for anyone who's watching, if you want to learn paper tool, and uh, there's a little step-by-step -step kit that you can pick up at the Reach if they're still available. Yeah. Um, and before I hand things back over to Amy, just to see if there's any questions in the chat, I just want to give a really quick shout out um, for anyone who is looking for opportunities to see other work by these three artists. Um, Karen Bubash, I want to mention that you have a solo show coming up later this year at the Audain Museum in Whistler, and that's going to open in September and run until January. Um, Karen Zalamea, um, you have some work coming up in a group exhibition titled Here and Now, which will be at the Pendulum Gallery in downtown Vancouver in April, and that that's also a part of the Capture Photography Festival. And Natalie, you, I, we just missed the, the timing, but you were just the featured artist at Hamilton's Winterfest with those beautiful light boxes. They were outside. Were they outside? I, I was just one of many artists. So there was like over 20 artists, but yeah. They, still, they look fantastic. Follow her on Instagram. And you've got some work coming up at the Art Gallery of Hamilton's Art Sale, which also runs through April. So if you want an opportunity to purchase work by Natalie, you should check them out. And also it goes, obviously, all funds go to support a good cause. So that wraps up my questions. Thank you, guys. It's really nice to see you, even virtually, even through these screens. So nice to see you. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with, Adrian. Uh, it's It was, it's, I am, uh, I'm a little bit heartbroken, but also, like, it's really nice that this was my last exhibition for the reach because it really I mean also I didn't have to do any of the install you guys did it Kate did it. I wasn't even there I shout, only shout out to Kate because she's yeah. amazing shout <laughs> out to everyone at the reach they're yeah. so good I, I very I, I I'm very grateful because I knew that my my former colleagues at the reach would of course shepherd this thing through and I knew that it was going to look fantastic so thank you everyone um and we'll welcome uh, Amy back into the space hi Amy Hey, thanks so much, Adrian. Um, we do have one question in the Q&A at the moment, and I've sent a little invitation through the chat, folks. We have time for maybe a few quick questions, um, so please feel free. Our first question is, does the development of virtual reality technology have a significant impact on the way photographers work? And so the uh, the question asker has asked this in a very general way, but I might encourage us to respond on a personal level too, if things like virtual reality technology um, has has affected how you're thinking about your own photographic work. Truthfully, I've never tried virtual reality technology. I've never put those goggles on. I don't know what it's like. So um, maybe I have to try it and maybe give a better answer, but um, I have yet to try it. So you can try if you can, it's very trippy. Yeah. yeah, it's not something I've ever considered. It seems like I have a 10 year old son and that seems more his whole forte. <laughs> He'll be moving in that direction. So maybe one day I'll have a response to kids and how they're using it, but not really my thing right now. Fair enough. Yeah, it's not something I've considered either, but I've seen it used really successfully by artists like Lisa Jackson. And so I think there's definitely room to to explore the possibilities of VR technology within exhibition spaces. And also augmented reality where like it's um, you can it's it's not necessarily the immersive headsets, but you see like through your screen, you can see aspects of a digital objects in the space around you sort of like I haven't played Pokemon Go but I'm told it's sort of like that I don't know <laughs> yeah unfortunately I played Pokemon Go with my son <laughs> um I might selfishly if it's okay with everybody I'm going to ask my own question um I was curious um 
and this came up with a few different responses. Um, the idea of, of like uh, repetition or um, labor or working uh, in a in a multiple way. One of the phrases that I use um, when I'm teaching, but also in my own practice, is willfully repetitive labor. The idea that kind of approaches things like um, craft based labor, where you're doing the same thing over and over again. And I was curious um, how folks, uh, if you could respond to that idea, does that resonate for you? Um, because I think for each of your works that's part of the exhibition at the Reach, I can certainly see how whether it's an installation tactic or a way of making the work that involves a, a decision or a dedication to really repeated labor. I can answer this because I've been thinking about this because um, we're working on a book for the O'Dean Museum. And we're having this discussion and I was reading, like, I know you, there's always rules that you can break, but someone was saying that there's two kinds of artists, the innovators and then the repeaters. And, you know, so like somebody like Rodney Graham, who was always working with like video, whether it's photography, he was constantly bending the rules. Or then you have, you know, painters like Cezanne or Picasso, where they were often painting the same image over and over and over. And for me, I've always felt I'm part of the latter, that it's like repeating an idea. The more I repeat it, um, the more that I think the idea starts to evolve. And within that repetition becomes the nuances that kind of, uh, I, like I think there's a lot of musicians that work in that way too. Like there's musical scores that repeat. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I really appreciate that insight. I just think that it's kind of lovely to, to have the hand involved in this idea of labor in the hand. And I remember one of my former professors in grad school said, machines don't labor, humans do. So <laughs> it's like, as humans, like uh, this kind of repetitive work um, is more laborious than machines because machines aren't human. But I think that kind of, that relationship to the hand is kind of lovely. Um, and I, I think see, I see it in all of our work, I think. Yeah. yeah. Especially like it seems more valuable now, like AI cannot copy what we're doing. It's impossible. Exactly. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, I love that term, willfully repetitive labor. I think it's definitely um, visible in the photographic ropes that I have in the show, um, which is very labor intensive process. And I consider it an ongoing project. And it takes days and days to make a single rope and it's intentionally set up that way and I see it as like a very intimate handling of a family photographic archive and just as Natalie said I think it's it's interesting how all three of us are really thinking through the, the hand of the photographer um, within a medium that is always so seemingly like mechanical. Mm -hmm. Yeah we all talked about that at the opening that we all had this kind of love-hate relationship with the labor involved with our work. It's interesting. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking time with my own question. Um, we don't have anything else in the chat or the Q&A, but we are also at time. So I wanted to say, Adrian, um, we do have an opening if you'd like to ask a wrap up question, um, but we can also uh, let folks go if, if we feel like we're ready. I think I think this feels a natural tied in a bow. But thank you so much, everyone. It's nice to see you all from Saskatoon. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so Have much. Thank you.